The final tumbler turned. Behind the wall, the unmistakable sound of a reel-to-reel cassette player starting. I told you! Montague half screamed. I tried to warn you of the horrors that await behind these walls! Pseudopod, episode 596. Ooh, aren't we close to a big number? Hmm. May 25th, 2018. This week's story, Mysterium Tremendum, part 3, by Laird Barron, and read by John Paget. Hey everyone, so I'm going to do the thing first, where I talk about the author and the narrator, and then I'm going to fulfill a lifelong dream, and then the story is going to happen. Oh, also, hello, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. So, this week brings us the conclusion of Mysterium Tremendum by uh, Laird Barron. Laird is an Alaskan author who raced the Iditarod three times during the early 1990s and has worked as a fisherman on the Bering Sea. Laird's work has appeared in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction and many other locations. His debut collection, The Imago Sequence and Other Stories, was published in 2007 by Nightshade Books. You can also find him in Black Wings, New Tales of Lovecraftian Horror, The Del Rey Book of Science Fiction and Fantasy, and many, many more. He was a 2007 and 2010 Shirley Jackson Award winner for his two collections, The Imago Sequence and Occultation and Other Stories. This novella, Mysterium Tremendum, won the 2010 Shirley Jackson Award for Best Novella. He's also a 2009 nominee for his novelette Catch Hell, and has been nominated for the Crawford, the Sturgeon, the International Horror Guild Award, the World Fantasy Award, the Bram Stoker Award, and the Locus Award. Laird is one of the finest authors working in this field today. The fact that we've got him, and the fact that we've got this story from him, is one of my favourite things about this job so far seriously. And one of the other things about this job so far that I love is that we got John Paget to read this for us. John is incredible. Uh, his work echoes Shirley Jackson, Thomas Ligotti, Bruno Schultz, many others. The Secret of Ventriloquism, his first collection, which contains stories that pseudopod listeners will find worryingly familiar, is brilliant. It defies adjectives like lead john's work really is that good and these last two weeks have really shown both their skills i think tremendously and john is as you can see a hell of a reader now if you'll excuse me there are two things i have dreamt of saying my whole life i got to say one of them last week and i get to say it again now previously on pseudopod Two couples, Willem and Glenn, Dane and Victor, go on a camping trip to the Pacific Northwest, which Willem uses as an excuse to investigate some leads and details from a mysterious occult gazetteer known as the Black Guide, which he discovers in a bookstore. Willem experiences a strange, ominous visitation from a spectral being, seemingly a deceased compatriot of Glenn, Dane and Victor's from their hell-raising, occult-dabbling youth. After ably fending off a vicious attempted gay bashing by rowdy local students outside a bar in Sequim, Washington, the group continues on in their quest. While camped out, fairly close to their goal, Willem spies large, strange creatures gathered outside their firelight, which soon disappear into the dark. And now the other thing. And now, the conclusion. Eleven. During breakfast, I relayed my encounter with the mystery animals, floating the idea that perhaps we should skip the hike. Wow, a couple of bears outside? Why didn't you get us up? I would have loved to see that. Victor seemed truly disappointed, while Dane and Glenn dismissed my concerns that we might run afoul of them during the day. Dane said, We'll just let Vicky run his yapper while we walk. Bears will hear that a mile away and beat it for the hills. Gonna be hotter than the hobs of Hades, Glenn said, after shrugging on his backpack. What the hell are hobs? Dane said. Hubs, farm boy, Glenn said. Don't neglect your canteens, fellow campers. Put on some sunscreen. Bring extra socks. How far are we going, the Andes? It's a surprise. Let's move out. I took the lead, Motoror de Caligenis in hand. The sky shone a hard, brilliant blue, and I already sweated from the rising heat. 
Fortunately, half the road lay in shadow and we kept to that. I felt rather absurd trudging along, like a pith-helmeted explorer in a black-and-white pulp film, novelty almanac map clutched in a death grip. Dane and Glenn even carried the requisite hatchets and machetes. Despite my morbid curiosity, it would have relieved me if the book had proved inaccurate. If we'd tromped for an hour or two until my comrades grew hot and irritable and voted to call it a trip and bolt for civilization. The beating I had received in Sequim had taken its toll, and I just wanted to face the music, to deal with any legal repercussions of the battle royale, and then soak in the hot tub for a month. But there it was, behind a screen of bushes and rocks. The path, little more than a deer trail, angled away from the road and climbed through a ravine overgrown with brush and ferns. There weren't any trail markers nor recent footprints. We picked our way over mossy stones and deadfalls, pausing frequently to sip from our canteens and for Dane and Victor to share a cigarette. Victor unlimbered his camera and snapped numerous pictures. Walking was slightly difficult, with the sling throwing off my balance. Glenn stayed close, taking my elbow whenever I stumbled. We pressed onward and upward, past a dozen points where the game trail forked and I would have lost the way if not for the landmarks detailed in the guide entry and by the subtle blazes the author had slashed into the bark of trees along the way. I whistled under my breath. My companions were silent but for the occasional grunt or curse. A similar hush had fallen over the woods. We rounded a bend and came to a spot where the trail forked yet again, except this time both paths were wider and recently trod by boots. Glenn spotted the ruins a second before I did, and just after Dane wondered aloud if we'd gotten lost and pegged me in the back with a pine cone. Everybody hold on. Glenn kept his voice low and pointed along the secondary path where it passed through a notch in the trees. I swept the area with binoculars. There was a clearing beyond the screen of trees, and piles of burned logs like a palisade had ignited into an inferno. Further in, discreet piles of charcoal debris glittered with bits of melted glass. This appeared to be the old ruins of an encampment or a village. I could imagine a mob of men in tri-corner hats loitering about, priming their muskets. This is weird, Victor said. You guys think this is weird? I said, in my opinion, this qualifies as weird. Also, highly unsettling. Unsettling, Dane said. Victor said, well, duh, don't know about you, but I'm picking up a creepy vibe. I dare you to walk down there and see if anybody's around. There's nothing left. Dane said. Victor said, That path didn't make itself. Somebody uses it. Like I said, walk your sweet little butt down there and take a gander. Not a chance, Dane said, and briefly mimed plucking strings as he hummed dueling banjos. Glenn took the binoculars and walked uphill to get a better vantage. He slowly lowered the glasses and held them toward me. Will? I joined him and scanned where he pointed. Offset from the main ruins, a canted stone tower rose four or so stories. The tower was scorched and blackened and draped in moss and creepers on a slight rise and surrounded by the remnants of a field stone wall. Window slots were bricked over and it was surmounted by a crenellated parapet. Anything about this in the guide? He said. I told him about the devil tower notation. I thought the entry referred to a rock formation or a dead tree, not a real live fucking tower. Something strange about that thing, Dane said. Besides the fact it's the completely wrong continent and time period for a medieval piece of architecture, and that said architecture is sitting on the side of a mountain in the Pacific Northwest, miles from any human habitation, Victor said. Dane said, yeah, besides that, I've seen it before, in a book or a movie. Fucked if I remember, though. I, I mean, it looks like it should be on the moors. Boris Karloff working the front door when the dumbass travelers stop for the night. How much farther, Glenn said. I consulted the book. Close. He said, 
Unless you guys want to hunt for souvenirs in the burn piles, let's mosey. None of us liked the ruins enough to hang around, and we continued walking. Fifteen minutes later, we arrived at our destination. The trail wound under the arch of a toppled dead log and ended in a large hollow partially ringed by firs and hemlocks. The hollow was a shadowy, green amphitheater that smelled of moist, decayed leaves and musty earth. Directly ahead reared the dolmen, two square pillars of rock supporting a third enormous slab. I was amazed by its cyclopean dimensions. The dolmen was seated near the slope of the hill and blanketed with moss, and at its base, ferns and patches of devil's club. It woke in me a profound unease that was momentarily overshadowed by my awe that the structure actually existed. None of us spoke at first. We stood close together and took in our surroundings. Glenn squeezed my wrist and pressed his hip against mine. Victor hadn't taken a single picture, demonstrably cowed upon encountering something so far beyond his reckoning. And Dane's mouth actually hung open. I whispered into Glenn's ear, The history channel isn't quite the same, is it? He smiled and pecked my cheek. That broke the tension, and after shucking their packs, the others began exploring the hollow. My uneasiness remained, a burr that I couldn't work loose. I checked the book again. The author hadn't written much about the site proper, nor documented any revelations about its history or importance besides the astronomical diagrams in the appendix. I stowed the guide and tried to set aside my misgivings as well. The moss that bearded the dolmen was also thick upon the ground, and it sucked at my boots as it sucked at the voices of my friends and the daylight itself. I thought of lying in a sticky web, of drowsing in the heart of a cocoon. The pain in my arm spiked, and I shook off the sudden lassitude. We approached within a few feet of the tomb and stared into the opening. This made me queasy, like peering over the lip of a pit. This was a stylized maw, the mossy path, its unfurled tongue. This isn't right, Glenn said. Victor and Dane flanked us, so our group stood before the structure in a semicircle. A hoax, I said without conviction, thinking of the artificial Stonehenge modern entrepreneurs had erected in eastern Washington as a tourist attraction. I don't think so, Glenn said. But I've seen a few of these in France. They don't look like this at all. The pile of rocks is close. That other stuff, I don't know. The stones were covered in runes and glyphs. Time had eroded deep grooves and incisions into shallow blue lines of demarcation. Lichen and horrid white fungi filled the crevices and spread in festering keloids. Dane forged ahead and boldly slashed at some of the creepers, revealing more carvings. Fat, misshapen puffball mushrooms nested in beds among the creepers and his machete hacked across some and they disintegrated in clouds of red smoke. I joined him at the threshold and shined the beam of my flashlight through the swirling motes of mushroom dust, illuminating a chamber eight feet wide and twenty feet deep. Stray fingers of reddish sunlight came through the small gaps. Vines had penetrated inside and lay in slimy, rotten loops and wallows along the edge of the foundation. My hair brushed against the slick threshold and beetles and pill bugs recoiled from our intrusion. Just inside, the chamber vaulted to a height of fifteen feet and was decorated with multitudes of fantastical carvings of symbols and creatures and stylized visages of the kind likely dreamt by Neanderthals. The far end of the chamber dug into the mountain, a wall of shale and granite sundered by long-past seismic violence into a vertical crack, its plates and ridges splattered rust orange by alkaline water oozing from rock. The floor was composed of dirt and sunken flagstones, and at its center, a low mound of crumbling granite that was an oblong basin. The opposite rim worked into the likeness of a massive, bloated humanoid. 
The statue was worn smooth and darkened by grime with only vague hollows for its eyes and mouth in a skull too proportionally small for its torso. I clicked off the flashlight and allowed my eyes to adjust to the crimson gloom. Okay, I'm thunderstruck, Glenn said. Gobsmacked, Victor said, his jovial tone strained. He shot a rapid series of pictures that promptly ruined my night vision with the succession of strobe flashes. The glyphs crawled and the primeval visages yawned and leered. Dane must have seen it as well. Stash that goddamn camera or I'm gonna ram it where the sun don't shine. Victor frowned and snapped the lens cap in place and in the midst of my visceral reaction to our circumstances, I wondered if this exchange was a window into their souls. And how much did Glenn know about that? I watched Glenn as he examined the idol and the pool. I felt a brief searing contempt for his gawky frame, his mincing steps and too skinny ass. I hung my head, ashamed, and also confused that something so petty and domestic would impinge upon the bizarre scene. For the hundredth time, I considered the possibility my meninges were filling with blood like plastic sacks. Up close, the basin was larger than I'd estimated and rudely chiseled, as if it were simply a hollowed-out rock. Small squarish recesses were spaced at intervals around the rim, each encrusted with lichen and moss, so they resembled mouths. Cold green water dripped from the ceiling and filled the basin, its surface webbed with algae scum and fir needles and leaves. The attendant figurehead loomed, imposing bulk precariously inclined forward, giving the illusion that it gazed at us. I glanced at my companions, their faces eerily lighted by the reflection of the water. A horrible idea took root, that these men masked in blood, eyes gleaming with febrile intensity, had conned me, maneuvered me to this remote and profane location. They were magicians, descendants of the Salamanca Seven, necromancers of the secret grotto, Satan's disciples who planned to slice my throat and conduct a black magic ritual to commune with their dear dead Tom, perhaps to raise him like Lazarus. Everything Glenn ever told me was a half-truth, a mockery. Tom hadn't been the black sheep sidekick, oh no, but rather the darksome leader a sorcerer who'd initiated each of them into the foul cabal. Any moment now, Dane or my sweet beloved Glenn would reach into his pocket and draw the hunting knife, sharpened just for my jugular. Victor's coil of rope would truss me, and then... Glenn touched my arm, and I choked back a cry, and everybody flinched. Their fear and concern appeared genuine. I allowed Glenn to comfort me smiled weakly at his solicitous questions. Victor said, Boys, what now? I feel like calling CNN, the Secretary of Interior, the somebody. Glenn rubbed his jaw. Vicky, it's in the book, so uh, apparently people are aware of this place. There's a burned-down village back that away. That explorer, Pavlov, Magalov, whatever, named it after himself. People surely know. Just because it's in the book doesn't mean jack shit. How come there's no public record? I bet you my left nut this site isn't even on the government radar. Question is, why? How is that possible? I said, an even better question is, do we want to screw around with the ineffable? Victor sighed. Oh, come on. You got the heebie-jeebies over some primitive art? Take a closer look at the demon faces, Dane said. This is Forces of Darkness shit. Hardcore Iron Maiden album cover material. He snorted and spat a lump of gory snot into the water. For a moment, we stood in shocked silence. If you want to flee, dears, say the word. Victor laid the sarcasm on too thick to fool anybody. Let's march back to the land of beer, pizza, and long hot showers. He drew a cigarette and leaned against the basin to steady himself. The snick of his lighter, the bloom of flame, shifted the universe off its axis. He shuddered and dropped the lighter and stepped back, 
far enough that I glimpsed a shivering cord. The diameter of a blue ribbon leech extended from beneath the lip of the basin and plunged into the junction of his inner thigh and groin. Greasy bubbles surfaced from the depths of the stagnant water and burst, their odor more foul than the effluvium of the dead vines liquefying along the walls, and the scum dissolved to reveal a surface as clear as glass. The trough was a divining pool and the water a lens magnifying the slothful splay of the farthest cosmos, where its gases and storms of dust lay like a veil upon the outer dark. A thumbnail-sized alabaster planetoid blazed beneath the ruptured skein of leaves and algae, a membraneous cloud rising. The cloud seethed and darkened, became black as a thunderhead. It keened, chains dragging against iron, a theremin dialed to eleven, a hypersonic shriek that somehow originated and emanated from inside my brain rather than an external source. Whispers drifted from the abyss, unsynchronized, unintelligible, yet conveying malevolent and obscene lust that radiated across the vast wastes of deep space. The cloud peeled, bloomed, and a hundred thousand miles long tendril uncoiled, a proboscis telescoping from the central mass, and the whispers amplified in a burst of static. I went cold, warmth and energy drained from my body with such abruptness and violence I staggered. Glenn shouted and jerked my shoulder and we tripped over each other. I saw Dane scrambling toward the entrance and Victor frozen before the idol, face illuminated in the lurid radiance. His expression contorted and he gripped his skull in both hands, fingernails digging. The slimy cord drew taut and released from the muscle of his leg with a wet pop left a bleeding circle in the fabric of his pants. Another of these appendages partially spooled from the niche nearest me, writhing blindly as it sought to connect with warm meat. The howl intensified, my vision distorted into streaks of white, resolving to the flickering vacuum of space where I floated near the rim of the earth, and the moon slid as a black disk across the face of the sun. Twelve. Glenn cuffed and shook me awake. His cheeks were wet with tears. You weren't moving, he said. I sat up and looked around. The unearthly light had faded to a dull glow, but I could make out some details of the chamber. Victor stood beside the idol, his back to us. He caressed the statue's rotund belly, palm flat the way a man touches his wife's stomach, feeling for the baby's kick. Dane was nowhere to be seen. I said, Vicky, Vicky, you okay? It required great effort to form the words. Victor slowly turned. Something was wrong with his face. Dried gore caked his forehead and temples. He grinned ghoulishly. You should have seen what I saw. This isn't a tomb. It's... He laughed, and it gurgled in his throat. <laughs> They'll be here soon, my sweets. Victor's certitude, the lunacy in his expression, his tone frightened me. Glenn, we've got to get out of here. I pushed away his arm and rose. Vicky, come on, let's find your husband. Where's Dane going? He won't leave me here, nor you, his best buddies. However, if he doesn't come to his senses, if he's run screaming for the hills, I'll visit him soon enough. I'll drag him home to the dark. Vicky, Glenn said. Victor mocked him. Glenn, be still. Be at peace. They love you. You'll see. You'll see. Everything will change. You'll be remade, turned inside out. We won't need our skin, our teeth, our bones. He licked his thumb and casually gouged his chest an inch above the nipple. Blood flowed, coursed over his rooting thumb and across the knuckles of his fist. Glenn screamed. I glanced at the ground near my feet, hoping for a loose rock with which to brain Victor. Victor ripped loose a flap of skin and let it hang, revealing muscle. We won't need this, friends. 
every quivering nerve, every sinew will be laid bare. He leaned over and reached for the switchblade taped to his ankle. Oh, shit, I said. Glenn said shrilly, what's that? There was movement in the fissure, a figure manifested as a pale smudge against the background. It was naked, and its skin glistened a pallid white like the soft meat of a grub. Its features were hidden by the gloom, and I was glad of that. Victor raised his arms and uttered a glottal exclamation. The man, it was a man, wasn't it, crept forward to the very edge of the crevice and hesitated there apparently loath to emerge into the feeble light despite its palpable yearning to do so. Whether man or woman, I couldn't actually determine as its wattles and pleats disguised its sex, but the figure's size and proportions were so large I couldn't imagine it being a woman. The weight of its hunger and lust echoed the empathic blast I'd received from the black cloud, and my mind itched as this damp, corpulent apparition whispered to me, tried to insinuate its thoughts into mine via a psychic frequency. I beheld again the cloud, a dank cosmic mold seeping from galaxy to galaxy, a system of hollow planets and a brown dwarf star nested within its coils and cockles. Sunless seas of warm ichor sloshed with the gravitational spin of those hollow, lightless worlds, spoiled yolks within eggshells. Hosts of darksome inhabitants squirmed and joined its terrible communion. I felt unclean, violated in bearing witness to their coupling. Beyond the entrance of the dolmen and the encircling trees, the sun burned cool and red. Soon it would be dusk, and then, and then, Vicky, for the love of God, get over here! Victor ignored me and shuffled toward the figure, and the figure's luminous flesh darkened with a spreading, cancerous stain, like a piece of paper charring in a flame, or a sheet soaked in blood. And it reached, extending a hideously long arm, its spindly fingers tapered to filthy, sharp points, those fingers crooked, beckoning languidly. What did it promise Victor with its whispers and wheedles? I moved without thinking. For if I'd stopped to think, I would have sprinted after Dane, who'd obviously exercised common sense in beating a retreat. I tackled Victor and slung him to the ground. The impact sent shocks through my wounded arm, and I almost fainted again. But I hung tough and pinned him. Stunned, he resisted ineffectually, flopped like a worm until I freed the pistol from my pocket and smacked him in the forehead with the butt. That worked, just like the movies. His eyes rolled back and he went limp. Glenn came running, and we grabbed Victor beneath the arms and dragged him from the chamber. The figure in the crevice laughed, a hyena drowning or a lunatic with a sliced throat. The flight down the trail toward camp was harrowing. We bound Victor's hands with his own belt and made a tourniquet to staunch the bleeding from his leg as it refused to clot, and half carried him as he raved and shrieked. I finally pistol whipped him again, and he was quiet after that. The entire way, I glanced over my shoulder, fully expecting the dreadful presence to overtake us. Hysteria galvanized me into forty minutes of superhuman exertion. Had Glenn not been there, I'm sure I could have easily hoisted Victor onto my shoulders and made like a track star. Dane jumped from the bushes near the main road, and Glenn nearly lopped his head with a hatchet. Dane had run to the camp before his panic subsided, and he'd mustered the courage to double back and find us. His shame was soon replaced by horror at Victor's condition, which neither I nor Glenn could fully explain. I convinced Dane there wasn't time to talk lest someone or something had followed us from the dolmen. So the three of us lugged Victor to camp, loaded the Land Rover, and got the hell off Mystery Mountain. 13. I put the pedal to the metal and Glenn made the calls as we hurtled down the logging road in the dark. The authorities were waiting at the campgrounds. Victor recovered from his stupor as they strapped him to a gurney. He cursed and snarled and thrashed until the paramedics tranquilized him. Dane, Glenn, and I were escorted to the local sheriff's office where the uniforms asked a lot of questions. The smartest move would have been to fudge the details. That's the movies, though. 
None of us were coherent enough to concoct a cover story to logically explain the hole in Victor's leg, or the monster, or the bad acid trip phantasmagoria of the pool. We just spilled the tale, drew an X on the topographical map, and invited the sheriff and his boys to go see for themselves. It didn't help our credibility that the cops found Victor's weed stash and several hundred empty beer cans in the truck. Ultimately, they let us walk. The fight at the tavern wasn't mentioned despite our mashed faces and missing teeth, which surprised the hell out of me. Victor's wound was presumed an accident. The investigators decided he harpooned himself on a branch while drunkenly wandering the mountainside. Personally, I preferred that version as well. The reality was too horrible. Victor's deranged state was obviously a hysterical reaction to the near-death incident. Our statements were taken and we were shown the door. Once the cops put two and two together that the four of us were queer, they couldn't end the conversation fast enough. Someone would be in touch, thank you for your cooperation, etc., etc. Dane went to stay with Victor at Harborview Hospital while Glenn and I returned home. Neither of us was in any shape to linger by Victor's bedside. I tried to talk Dane into crashing at the house to no avail. He hadn't even acknowledged the offer. His face was blank and prematurely lined. I'd seen refugees from shelled villages wearing the exact same look. In his own way, he was as removed from reality as Victor. Glenn fared a little better. He was a wreck, too, but we had each other. I dreaded his reaction when the shock dissipated and the magnitude of the tragedy sank in. He'd lost one friend, possibly forever, and the jury was out on the other. God help me, the bed of my heart savored the notion. I finally had him all to myself. Another, even more bitter and shriveled bit, slightly gloated over the fact it was finally his turn to suffer. I'd done all the crying in our relationship. Dalton meowed when we came in and turned on the lights. The house, our comfy furniture and family pictures, all of it seemed artificial, props from someone else's life. I showered for the first time in several days, spent an hour with my forehead pressed against the stall tiles. I saw the wound in Victor's leg, his mouth chanting soundlessly, saw the stars thicken into a stream that poured into that black hole. The black hole, the black cloud, was limned in red. And it made me think of the broken circle on the cover of Motoror de Caligenis. These images were not exact, not perfectly symmetrical and the hot water cascading over my back no longer thawed me. My teeth chattered. I wrapped myself in one of the luxuriously thick towels we'd gotten for a mutual anniversary gift and limped into the hall and found Glenn on hands and knees, his ear pressed to the vent. What the hell? I said. He gestured awkwardly over his shoulder for quiet. After a few moments, he rose and dusted his pajamas with a half-dozen brisk pats. I thought the TV was on downstairs. It's not. Must have been sound traveling along the pipes from the neighbors, or uh, I don't know. Let's hit the rack, huh? I lay in bed, chilled and shaking. Glenn, a dead lump, next to me. The accent lamp in the hall gave a warm, albeit fragile, yellow light. Without shifting to face me like he normally would have, Glenn said, Tommy fell in a hole in the woods. That's how he really died. I said, yeah, Vicky told me, you fucker. Glenn still didn't move. I couldn't recall him ever being so still. He said, I figured that's why you've been so bent. Then you know why we kept quiet? No, I don't. The light flickered and now Glenn's head turned. True, you don't. I apologize. I should have come clean long ago. Tommy was so deep into black magic it blew my mind when I finally caught on. He always sneered at the lightweight stuff me and Dane fooled with. I really believed he was just a redneck who made good. Then we hit some extra heavy-duty acid one night, and he bared his soul. We were on spring break and spending a weekend in the Mojave with some of the guys, and 
he got to rambling. His parents were basically illiterate, but he had well-to-do relatives on his mom's side, scholars. He lived a few summers with them, and they turned him on to very, very dark occultism. Tommy intimated he'd taken part in a human sacrifice. He, he lied to impress me, I'm sure. I wasn't sure. What did they do, the relatives? His uncle was a professor, world traveler, who went native. Here, Tommy, tell it, the old dude was a connoisseur of the black arts, but specialized in blood rituals and necromancy. Tommy said the man could uh, conjure things, Dr. Faustus style. I might have laughed at that the other day, I said. The lamp flickered again, and shadows raced across the wall. Glenn said, Tommy showed me some moldy manuscript pages he carried in his pocket. They were wrinkled and obviously torn from a book. The words were written in Latin. He actually read Latin. He wouldn't say what they meant, but he consulted them later when we went on our trip into the Black Hills near Olympia. Looking back, I get the feeling maybe he had his own black guide. It could have been a possum stew recipe from his grandma's cookbook, I said. The motherfucker didn't come visit me in the night. I dreamed that when I was rocked off my ass. The guide, well, there's a coincidence. I'm not going to buy a conspiracy theory about how dead Tom made sure we found it at ye old knick-knack shop. I sure as fuck ain't going to worry my pretty head over what we saw on the mountain. I'm sorry for Vicky and Dane. We're okay, though, and I say, let sleeping dogs lie. I breathed heavily and stared at the hall lamp so hard my eyes hurt. Ignoring those sleeping dogs is what got us here. Tommy talked and talked that enchanted evening at a scary expression as he watched me. His eyes were so strange. I got paranoid, thinking he wasn't really high, that this was a test or a trap. I remember him saying there was sure as God made little green apples life out there. He pointed to the stars. Cold night in the desert, and those stars were right on top of us in their billions. He wanted to meet them, except he was afraid. His uncle warned him the only thing an advanced species would want from us would be our meat and bones. Glenn didn't say anything for a while. He rubbed my arm, which still ached fiercely. Finally, he said, Everything returned to normal after the Mojave trip. He didn't mention our chat, didn't seem to recall letting me in on his secret life. A few months later, it was summer vacation and we were knocking around Seattle. I came home to visit my folks and the others tagged along. Tommy put together an overnight hike and away we went. I saw him fall into the hole as we were walking way up in the hills along a well-beaten path. Mountain bikers used it a lot, even though it's a remote spot. Dane and Victor were joking around, and I glanced over my shoulder exactly as Tommy fell. I didn't tell those two what I saw. I made a show of yelling for him until Dane found the sinkhole. Of course, we called in the troops. I'm sure Vicky told you what happened next. Cops, fish and wildlife, everybody we could think of. No luck. That pit just dropped into the center of the earth and it was impossible to help him. To this day, nobody but me is completely sure that's where Tommy disappeared. It makes the most sense. Him tripping into a bottomless pit is awful, yeah? Not as awful as other possibilities, though. The lamp clicked off and on three times and I raised myself against the headboard and clutched the coverlet to my chin. I lost interest in finally getting to the bottom of Tommy's death and the weird conspiracy to sanitize its circumstances. Holy shit, Glenn, please stop. I've got a bad feeling. I had a sense of impending doom. In fact, I could easily envision a colossal meteor descending from on high and smashing the house to bits. Dalton fluffed into a ball of bristling fur and scooted under the bed where he hissed and growled. Glenn kept rubbing my arm, and the light flickered again and again, and the filament ticked like a rattler. I never told the guys what I really saw that day. Tommy didn't fall. He was snatched by a hand. Not a hand that belonged to any regular person I've seen. An arm, fish belly white, shot up 
and caught his belt and yanked him in, and the hand had claws. He didn't even scream. He didn't make a peep. It happened so fast I thought it couldn't be real. I dreamed it, like you dreamed Tommy was in the living room after the party. I can't believe this shit, I said. What had Tommy expected to find in the Black Hills? Another ancient ruin hidden from all but the initiated and the doomed? I was getting colder. I wanted to ask Glenn if he still loved Tommy. Nothing he said would have mattered. And so I comforted myself with smoldering resentment. When we were in the dolmen, did you get a look at the guy's face? He said. The dude in the crevice? That freaky inbred motherfucker who got separated from all his Ozarks kin? No. I did, Glenn said. It was him. The light went off and stayed off. Fourteen. I woke with a dry mouth. Glenn's covers were thrown back and his side of the sheets were cool. I listened to the creaks of the house. The power was out. Glenn laughed downstairs. He said something unintelligible. In my semi-conscious state, I assumed he'd called the power company and was sharing a joke with the poor sap manning the phone center. Fuzzy-headed, I put on my robe and negotiated the hall and the stairs. A bit of starlight in the tip of the crescent moon gleamed through the windows. Glenn had lighted a candle in the kitchen, and it led me through the haunted woods to the doorway. It was only a single candle, a fat one I'd bought at a bookstore for my office, but stuck in a kitchen drawer for emergencies instead, and so the room remained mostly in gloom. She slouched at the opposite end of the dining table. She was naked and lush and repellently white. Her hair was long and thick and black. Her hands rested on the table and her fingers and cracked, sharp nails were far too long and thin. Modoror de Caliginus lay open before her. She lazily riffled pages and smiled at me. I couldn't see her teeth. Glenn stood to her left in the breakfast nook, the toes of his slippers in the light, his shape otherwise indistinct. He waited mutely. Who are you? I said to her, although I already knew. The covetous way she handled the guide made it clear. Three guesses, she said, in a perfectly normal, good-humored tone. Rose, I presume, I said, voice cracking and ruining my attempt at bravado. How kind of you to drop in. The gun was in my coat in the living room. I thought I might make it if I ran and if I didn't trip over anything. How kind of you to open your home. Thank you for the lovely note. Yes, I had a fabulous visit to the peninsula. And points beyond. That's saying, mm, a nice place to visit. Well, I liked it so much, I decided to naturalize. Glenn, I said. I was exhausted. It came over me in a wave, the seasick feeling of giving way too much blood at the nurse's station. I resisted a sudden compulsion to collapse into a chair and lay my head on the table. My fingers and toes tingled. I gripped the doorframe for balance. Glenn! I tried again, weak, hopeless. Glenn said nothing. He's not for you. He belongs to Tommy, Rose said. He belongs to us. We love him. You were never part of their inner circle, were you, Willem? Second best for Glenn. His vanilla life after graduation into the real world of jobs, bills, routine sex. No thrills, not like college. She closed the book and traced the broken ring on its cover. Alas, nice guys do indeed finish last. I, however, believe in second chances and do-overs. Would you like a do-over, Willem? You'll need to decide whether to come along with us and see the sights, or not. You are more than welcome to join the fun. Goodness knows, I hope you do. Tommy does, too. The cellar door had swung open while I was distracted. Rose stood and took Glenn's hand. They passed over the threshold. He turned and stared at me. Behind him was infinite blackness. Her arms, pale as death, emerged from that blackness, 
and draped his shoulders. She caressed him. She whispered in his ear and in mine. The pull was ineluctable. I released the door frame and crossed the room in slow, tottering steps like a man wading into high tide. The universe whirled and roared. I came within kissing distance of my love and looked deep into his dull, wet eyes, gazed into the bottomless pit. His face was inert but for the eyes. Maybe that was really him, waiting somewhere down there in the dark. Oh, honey, I said, and stepped back and shut the door. Fifteen. I sold the house and moved across the country. For nearly a decade, I've lived on a farm in Kingston, New York, with an artist who welds bed frames and puts them on display in galleries. We share the property with a couple of nanny goats, some chickens, two dogs, and Dalton. I write my culture essays. Although Bert makes enough, neither of us needs a real job. Repairing the fences in the field, patching the shed roof, and making the odd repairs around the house keeps me occupied. Keep me from chewing my nails. Nothing can help me as I lie awake at night, unfortunately. That's when I do the real damage to myself. Against my better judgment, I mailed the black guide to Professor Berman, though I cursed him for a fool during our last email exchange. Victor's confined to an asylum, and his doctor contacts me on occasion, hoping I'll reveal what massive trauma befell his patient to precipitate his catastrophic break from reality. From what I gather, Victor keeps journals, dozens of them. He's got a yin for astronomy and physics, and at least one scientist thinks he's a savant. Dane disappeared three years after our fateful trip and hasn't resurfaced. His credit cards and bank accounts remain untouched. The cops asked me about this, too. I really don't know, and I don't want to, either. Bert raised his eyebrows when I bought the 12-gauge shotgun a few months back and parked it by my side of the bed. I told him it was for varmints, and he accepted that. There are cougars and bears and coyotes lurking in the nearby forest. He hasn't a clue that when he's away on his infrequent art show trips, I sit in our homey kitchen by the light of a kerosene lamp with the gun on the table and watch the small door leading into the cellar. The door is bolted, not that I'm convinced it matters. It began a few weeks ago and only happens when Bert's out of town. He's not a part of this, thank God, for small favors. The dogs used to lie at my feet and whine. Lately, the normally loyal pair won't come into the room after dark, and I don't blame them. Bert's in the city for the weekend. He's mixing with the royalty and pining for home, has said as much in no less than a half dozen phone messages. I sit here in the gathered gloom with a bottle of scotch, a glass, and a loaded gun. Really? It's pointless. I sip scotch and wait for the soft, insistent knocks against the cellar door, for Glenn to whisper that he loves me. Guilt and loneliness have worked like acid on my insides. God help me, but more and more I'm tempted to rack the slide and eject the shells, send them spinning across the floor. I'm tempted to leave the deadbolt unlocked. Then see what happens next. One of the things I love about my job is being surprised. It doesn't happen very often, but I suspect it happens rather more than I let myself see. You see, the thing is I have a Jack Ryan brain. When it comes to narrative, at the very least, all you have to do is put the components in front of me and I'll assemble them. And chances are, 70 to 80% of the time, I'll be right. Seriously, you ever see Hunt for Red October? If you haven't, you should. It's quite good. The bit in that where he puts together what Ramius is doing, basically through actual Act of God level random item placement in his line of vision, I can do that with stories. 
any medium. Like I say, usually to about 70 to 80 percent accuracy. I am very far from perfect, but when I'm on point, I tend to be all the way on point. It's a function of a lot of things. Working as a stage magician, my degree training, the decade or so I've spent out in the wilderness, whittling pop culture analysis into trees, passing bears and the odd dead trapper, and how I live my life. I understand the things that have happened to me, that I've done and have been done to me, because I understand stories. This is my toolkit. This is my control panel. This story hacks it in the best way. You see, there are certain expectations with horror. Gay characters are dead. Black characters are dead first. The survivors will be marked but not maimed, and on we go. These are generalizations, of course, but generalizations are like urban myths. There's a grain of truth in them, and occasionally an alligator. But the ending here just messes me up in the best way. Everyone lives, even if not everyone is happy about it. The Faustian deals of the past are revealed in a manner that's as normal as it is profoundly unsettling, and the cellar door, that most beautiful of phrases, really is the gateway to something rich, strange, and terrible. Better still, lead subverts not only the expectations of the genre, but the expectations of us experiencing a story. This is a complete satisfying, remarkably well-designed narrative, which is just the tip of a much, much larger narrative iceberg that the characters and we are cursed or blessed to glimpse. It's the lobstrosity passing by in the mist again. It's brushing up against something unknowable. It's that thing that makes me love this genre so much. And better still, even after everything Willem has gone through, everything he's done, he kind of wants to see what's behind that door. That is the horror I live for. The hard emotional truth that humanity is fascinated by what kills, and if we're lucky, eats us, wrapped up in such a subtle, measured, razor-sharp piece of fiction. What would you do? Which would you choose? Safety or exploration? A life or an endless discovery where the only thing you lose is you? Outstanding work, both of you. Thank you, gentlemen. If you enjoyed this story, please consider pre-ordering the upcoming thriller, Blood Standard. Blood Standard is the answer for those of you who have been looking for more fiction that will scratch the same itch as True Detective. While there are no blood cults obsessed with the works of Robert W. Chambers, we get a similar nihilistic perspective with cosmic horror lurking at the threshold. As I have come to expect from Laird Barron, it never condescends to the reader and ratchets the tension with inexorable doom. The pacing and action are excellently crafted. I think this passage encapsulates what's waiting for you in the dark. For once, I admire what you're doing. It's a doom gesture, alas. The girl you're searching for is probably dead. You're no hero. You are your father's son. You've seen too much, got too much of the bad blood in you. The world is a traveling slaughterhouse. It's rolling through space at 67,000 miles per hour. Earthquakes, volcanoes, tidal waves, and deep freezes. Extinction events. Insects devour one another by the gross ton. Animals are red of tooth and claw, and men commit genocide with bigger and better weaponry every few generations. You, son of mine, are the edge of the blade that cuts through everything in its path, guilty or innocent alike. Blood Standard, coming to shelves near you on May 29th. We rely on you to cover our server costs, pay our authors, pay our staff, and you don't let us down. We have remarkable backers, and we have several ways for you to join them. If you like, you can go to pseudopod.org and click on Feed the Pod. There, you'll be faced with two options. One is donate, which is any amount you want. The other is subscribe. If you start at about five bucks a month, that will gain you access to the premium content folder, which includes all the stuff we've produced across our 14 years of existence and has new material added to it regularly. In fact, upcoming we have my conversation with Karen Bovenmeyer, about the fascinating book The Secret History of Wonder Woman that should be going in there over the weekend. If PayPal doesn't float your boat, 
then give Patreon a shot. We have a lot of backers over there, and again, at the five buck level, you gain access to that premium content folder. Anything below that, you have the news feed. Anything above that, you can help us out with some decision making, get some free stuff, um, personalized book recommendations, that kind of thing. All of that's great. We love doing that, and we have a really, really good relationship with our donors and backers over there at both those sites, and it's really good fun. But we're also very cognizant of the fact that it's possible that you may not have the spare cash to back us, and that's fine. The last thing we would want to do is put any of you in financial trouble so you could help us out of not getting close to financial trouble. And the thing is, there is something you could do which doesn't cost you anything. Signal boost. If you listen to a story and you like it, tweet a link to it or review us on iTunes. We would love more reviews on both iTunes and Google Play. Or if you have a blog or a podcast that you would like us to guest on or interview us on or just have us on to have a chat, please let us know because we love doing that kind of thing and it raises our profile and it raises your profile and everybody wins. So, PayPal patreon or signal boosting that's three ways you can help out oh one last thing while i remember uh we get semi-regular requests in fact increasingly regular requests from people asking us whether we're on spotify we're not yet spotify runs their podcasting site on an invite only model for the time being we haven't been invited yet and our understanding is the more people ask the more likely you are to be invited. So if you want to see us on Spotify, tell them, and hopefully we'll be there soon. So signal boosting, PayPal, Patreon, those are the three ways you can help out. And if you can, please do. We'll be back next week when, as this week and every week since Aeon's past, we will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. And we leave you with this quote, from John Carpenter's classic, Prince of Darkness. From Job's friends insisting that the good are rewarded and the wicked punished, to the scientists of the 1930s proving to their horror the theorem that not everything can be proved, we've sought to impose order on the universe. But we've discovered something very surprising. While order does exist in the universe, it is not, at all, what we had in mind. Thanks, folks. We'll see you next week.